friends warm welcome and uh, good afternoon to all of you i am dr abhay dikshit president of fpi again welcoming you all for this uh, uh, very very informative webinar and you know that uh, uh, there are lot of viruses which are around us and uh, we have to uh, tackle and uh, uh, we have to uh, just fight against those uh, viruses so today we have chosen a very good subject of monkey pox then uh, the uh, reemergence of uh, swine flu and uh, what is the status latest status of uh, covid 19 so all these three things will be dealt with by our three great experts of this field for today's uh, uh, webinar we are having dr dinesh gohil and dr yadish rapsiwaga as chair persons and the coordinators for this webinar dr yadish rapsiwaga is from surat he is a very Hello. academic person he is a, he has presented so many papers and won also so many prizes about the paper, uh, presentation of the papers and uh, he is a beneficiary and very very much enthusiastic and uh, one more feather in cap that he is a very good uh, uh, say anchor also and uh, the uh, he he goes uh, the music very much he is a good singer also right so thank you thank you abhay yeah welcome dr yati sabshi aur yeah thank you the second coordinator is dr dinesh gohil he is from uh, uh, bhavnagar and uh, uh, before two years we have a very good record of a bhavnagar unit of fpi that having so many webinars in series of webinars throughout the year and uh, dr dinesh gohil was the instrumental part of this he is also a chemistry physician and also academic minded person so i also welcome dr dinesh gohil thank you sir and without wasting much of time i straight away uh, give the mic to dr yati sabshiwa and to dr dinesh gohil to proceed the further for the today's webinar dr yati bhai and dr dinesh gohil please thank you sir thank you very much yeah, now uh, uh, i would like to request our uh, uh, lapsiwala sir to start with the introduction of the first speaker please sir good afternoon everybody good afternoon uh, how many of you have seen kgf chapter 2 in that movie rocky bhaiya is a that is a very famous dialogue violence 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 i don't like it i avoid but violence likes me i can't avoid and such is the case with all of us doctors virus 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 i don't like it i avoid but virus likes me i can't avoid virus so friends this is the scenario of the day the drums of the uh, covid 19 are still biting on our head and the old uh, swine flu is already there and now the new introduction monkey pox monkey pox is uh, uh, making us scratch our head so ffpi has decided to take up all these three viruses together with our expert eminent speakers and as all of you know we have with us very famous very popular speakers dr arman dru Dr. Netram Netram and Dr. Pratik Savaj, they will be speaking on these viruses. Let us start first with uh, Dr. Norman Dru, Dr. Urman Dru, and he will be covering monkeypox. Friends, he will be covering almost all the topics that we family physicians must know and must understand. Am I audible, sir? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dr. Dhru is a director of uh, Department of Internal Medicine and Diabetes at HCG Hospital, Ahmedabad, and uh, a very popular, very darling uh, speaker for all the audience. So, with before without wasting much time, I welcome Dr. Dhru and I request him to start his sharing for monkeypox. Thank you, Dr. Dhru. Please. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you very much, sir. I hope I'm audible and my screen is visible. Yes, yes, yes. You are audible, okay. sir. And your yes, screen yes. is also there. So, for last 10 years, we have been getting diseases from the swine, from the bat, from the monkeys, from the rodents. And it becomes very difficult to understand, are we allopathic doctor or are we veterinary doctors? Because we are these days treating the diseases which used to be uh, only occurring amongst the animals. Or probably we have gone very closer to animal, if not in the nature, through nature. So today we are going to talk in next 15 minutes about monkeypox and erupting volcano. I'm Dr. Urmandru talking with you. So what's monkeypox? We all know COVID is a uh, RNA virus. Monkeypox is a thick, 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 much bigger double-stranded DNA virus. What's the difference between RNA and DNA virus? DNA virus, which are heavier, they do not stay in the atmosphere for a longer time and they require bigger droplet to climb onto. And therefore, although they can have respiratory or air transmission, that mode of transmission is less. What is another significance? Another significance is this is 190 kilo Bolton, which means it hardly gets mutated. And therefore, the future is good as far as monkeypox is concerned. Well, this is not a new disease. This has been occurring endemically in Africa for long, long time. But remember, this is not a disease of monkeys. It's a misnomer. Just because it was first researched in a colony of monkey which were being used for research, it is known as monkeypox. Otherwise, it's a disease of rodents. It's a viral genetic disease, primary occurring in Africa. And this is the structure of monkeypox virus. Remember, when we talked about COVID, we used to require to learn everything about this COVID virus because we were just planning a vaccine against COVID virus. And so we needed to know against which structure we should create the vaccine. Here, this is not an issue. The vaccine is already available, so we may not go into the details of the structure. Well, how does it spread? Primarily through animals, and these are the common symptoms, which you'll see one after another. Between 1970 and 2021, 51 years the disease remained confined to Africa. But now, within last one year, it has started spreading across 77 countries where it never used to spread. How does it transmit? Primary infection is from rodents, infected rodents, as you can see, the rats, to humans. Those who handle these rodents, they get it from rodents. Contact with contaminated animal or the animal products can cause infection in the human. And then comes the secondary transmission, which was limited only to Africa till now. And that was human to human. And that was because of contact with infected people. There is also mother to fetus transmission known as congenital monkeypox. How does this disease transmits? Unprotected contact and the virus can also enter through some different ways. So unprotected contact with respiratory droplets. But here for COVID, you require to be within six feet range of the person and the respiratory droplets are floating in the uh, atmosphere after coughing. This does not happen with monkeypox. More or less, it transmits from lesion material and body fluids, from the ulcers or from the skin rashes or from the body fluids like semen, blood, or even perspiration or vomiting. So contaminated materials and even surfaces. So overall, you can see that for monkeypox to be transmitted, the person has to be in the close contact of the patient and that too for a prolonged period. Just going near to the patient would not transmit it. You have to be in the close contact. So hugging, kissing, or even 
sleeping with a partner can uh, lead to transmission. The disease can transmit from respiratory tract, broken mucous membranes, that is eyes and mouth, so from lips and eyes, and also through broken skin. That is by animal bites, or if you got a skin prick, a pin prick, or an ulcer, and then you are in contact with a patient's uh, uh, contaminated material, you may get it. So be assured that just entering into the room of the patient, you are not going to have monkeypox. So you don't need to be very much afraid. However, as a uh, healthcare uh, practitioner, especially those healthcare practitioners who con are in contact with the patients from the day one, family physicians have to be little more careful. There are four stages of this disease. First disease, five to, first uh, stage is incubation, five to 21 days, a very long incubation. So if you are in contact with a person who had documented monkeypox, you can get the disease within three weeks, not immediately. So you have to be careful for 21 days. What does this mean? All contacts have to be followed up for three weeks. All contacts of a documented patient have to be followed up for three weeks at least or till they develop symptoms. Second stage is febrile stage when one to four days of fever, which is self-limiting after four day, swollen lymph nodes, headache, chills, sore throat, malaise and fatigue, very classical of viral illness. In addition, swollen lymph nodes. This is the time when the virus is in the blood. This is the time when rashes start first from the mouth. That is the fourth or fifth day of the disease. And then these are the rashes, maculopapular rashes, convert into vesicles, pustules, and then crust. They become crusted at the end of 21 days and fall down. During all this period of this transition from macule to crust, the patient is infective. Generally, it takes three weeks. And this rest stage, the virus is now present in the skin lesions. This is the time when antibodies start producing. And virus, which was there in the blood, gets shifted to skin lesions. And the last stage is recovery, where the crust gets fallen down, disrupted, and the patient becomes a uh, non-infective, although the scars may remain just like smallpox. So, in nutshell, 5 to 21 days of incubation period, 1 to 4 days of febrile stage, 2 to 4 weeks of rest stage, and days to week of recovery. Incubation period, there may or may not be symptoms. Generally, only if the symptoms are there, the patient would be infective to others. Febrile stage, fever and lymphadenopathy. Rest stage, any rashes on the skin and recovery. Remember, a clue to the rashes. The rashes spread centripetally and generally, rashes spare the abdomen. If you find rashes on the abdomen, it is very, very less likely to be monkeypox. So, always check the abdomen first. No rashes, only then you suspect monkeypox. Rashes on the abdomen is very much against the diagnosis of monkeypox. This is April and June 2022, a very nice study across 16 countries. And it suggested 528 cases in those 16 countries. Now the disease has spread in 77 countries. 98% per percentages of patients were gay or bisexual men. This was the situation in June. The situation is changing gradually. Now only 60% or 50% of patients are gay. The rest of them are because of close contact of the person. And therefore, every time you diagnose a monkeypox, don't start thinking that the patient must be a gay man that is going to create a problem for everyone. So it is not so now. 
95 percent of the uh, uh, transmission initially occurs through sexual activity. Now it is more or less because of close contact and lymphadenopathy and fever were the commonest presentation. How do you differentiate monkey frogs from chicken pox and measles? Number one, chicken pox is generally seen in children. Monkey pox till now has paired the children and elderly individuals. Why we will see. So chicken pox and measles, one to three days before the rash, fever would be there. In other way around, fever, three days followed by rashes. Chicken pox, same thing. And measles also the same thing. Rash appearance, lesions often in one stage of development. So either all of them would be pustules or macules or they all would be crusted lesions. Chicken pox, lesions in multiple stages. On hand, you may see macules. On the face, you may see pustules. Same way, lesions would be in multiple stages in measles. So if you see all lesions all alike and absent lesions on the abdomen, it's more likely to be monkeypox. Rest development, slow, rapid and rapid in chickenpox and measles. Rest distribution, more on face, present on palms and soles, but never on abdomen. So they are never central. They are more on the periphery. While the chickenpox lesions are more on the trunk and they are always absent on the palm and soles. While the measles starts from the face and spreads sometimes to the hands and feet. So lesions on the abdomen, once again, I will draw your attention, more likely to be chickenpox and measles. Lesions on the face and palms and soles, more likely to be monkeypox. Lymphadenopathy always present in monkeypox as a general rule, while in chickenpox and measles, they are absent. Death up to 10%, although it is very less at present, you seem to, it seems that it is very less, but it is not so. India have got nine cases and one death. So exactly fits into 10%. Rare deaths you see in chickenpox and measles. Natural colds, it's a self-limited disease with the symptoms lasting from two to four weeks. Severe cases can occur very rarely. Case fatalities these days is three to six percent. Treatment, no specific treatment is required. You may use any local powder, antiseptic powder for the rashes. If there is itching, which is very rare with monkeypox, you can use the uh, antihistaminics. For fever, one can use either of paracetamol or even NSAIDs if there are no contraindications. And uh, cyproeptidine is one drug which helps to improve the appetite in monkeypox. Otherwise, you do not require any specific treatments. The lesions which are ulcerated may be uh, 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 tracing may be done with the help of any antibiotic ointment with gloves on and also the mask on. You can do the dressing. Most of the time, you do not require it. You should ask the patient to wear full sleeve clothes to avoid the contact of lesions with the bed sheet or with any other person. That is always advisable. Antiviral drugs are available, although they have not been required. Now, once again, see something good for India. Antiviral drugs, there are two antiviral drugs that we'll see. Both of them are in, uh, in severe crisis or limited amount in USA and Canada, where the disease is more prevalent these days, and even in Europe. In India, both the drugs are available and both the drugs are produced by India only. So once again, India proving to be the pharmaceutical hubs. How do you prevent? Raising the awareness of the risk factors and educating the people, educating the doctors, learning about it very well, and scientific studies. There is a vaccine available. The vaccine is same as that was used in smallpox. Smallpox vaccine has now been confined to laboratory to prevent the spread of smallpox. But now, once again, it will have to be brought out. And Gynaeus, also known as Imvamun or Imvanex, has been licensed in USA to prevent monkeypox and smallpox. Vaccine is not required in India 
at present. If you take enough care in suspecting monkeypox and then use the preventive measures like gloves, avoiding uh, using uh, the soap and water, then you do not require vaccine. Will it become last three slides? Will it become a global pandemic like COVID-19? Less likely to happen because transmission is not airborne. Asymptomatic people do not spread the disease like COVID used to do. Takes long time to develop symptoms, three weeks to develop the symptoms. So till the symptoms are there, patients is not infective. We already have a vaccine if required that would be utilized and population already has immunity from past smallpox vaccination. Look at your deltoid. If you have got a scar of smallpox, you are probably immune or strongly resistant to monkeypox. So that scar is probably your insurance policy. We are better equipped now. We know how to tackle pandemic, especially India has done it very, very well. We already have a treatment for monkeypox, tecovirimet and sidofivoy. Both the antiviral drugs are perfectly effective for monkeypox and they are 100% effective. None of the patients till now, 200 across the globe or nine in India required these medicines. Mortality from monkeypox is currently low and virus is presently manifesting in MSM population, that is gay population. There are two strains, A2 and B1. Fortunately, all nine patients in India have A2 strain, which is absolutely a benign strain. It does not change often. Mutation is very rare. So does it mean that we should relax, cool down and ignore this disease? Absolutely no. Virus jumps to large population. At present, it has not affected children and seniors. But the moment it would affect children and seniors, we will be in trouble. And that can always happen. Monkeypox could jump to our rodent population and then it becomes endemic in India. So if it affects the rats, we are going to be in trouble. Becoming a bigger deal every day. One patient, two patients, nine patients. Today, 10 patient has been detected. Fortunately, in Gujarat, both the suspected patients are negative. 77 countries which have had no endemicity have already reported outbreak. Four people have died, one in India, one in Brazil and two in Spain. And we know our deficiencies also while treating COVID. So monkeypox reminds that we are at the mercy of virus and it is not the virus that is staying with us. We are staying amongst the virus. Last time, the disease has a wrong name, wrong classification. It is sending a wrong message across the world that everyone that is affected is a gay. Number is an underestimate, probably more people have it, but because it has been stigmatized as being gay, people fear to come forward. We need a dead end. We need a last patient rather than the ninth or tenth patient from where the disease stops going ahead and vaccination is not for all. So stay alert. These are some do's and don'ts suggested by ICMR, mask, gloves, washing hands. So stay alert. That is the key message. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Urmandro. That was very wonderful, very comprehensive lecture. All the points that the family physician needs to know have been covered. Uh, still, if any, I request the audience, uh, I mean, all the audience are on YouTube. They are watching us on YouTube and I request them, if any questions are there, you can write down in the comment section of the YouTube uh, uh, frame. In the comment section, you can ask the questions and we'll try to cover it, uh, all the questions. Uh, there was one question, uh, whether the transmission is through lesions with, uh, I mean, uh, contact with lesions only, skin lesions only? Hello, Dr. Dhruv. There is one question for you. Uh, whether the transmission is through contact with the skin lesions only or respiratory transmission is also there? Respiratory transmission is also there, but it requires a closer, longer contact of more than six hours persistent contact with the patient within six feet vicinity. Intermittent contact or 
a contact less than six hours at a time would not cause the damage. Therefore, family physicians who are examining the patients in their clinics are should not be much worrying unless they touch the body fluids of the patient. So we should avoid the avoid touching the skin lesions. That is the main most important thing. And if at all you touch, use the disposable gloves, gloves and wash your hands with soap and water. Therefore, family physicians who are examining the patient. I think any question comes, we'll uh, take in the uh, second, uh, after the second lecture. Uh, so I request Dr. Dinesh Gohil to proceed further. Thank you, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay. Uh, let me introduce our second speaker. Today, our second speaker is Dr. Vasu Nethara Kesar God. He is practicing as a consultant interventional pulmonologist in Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. He is having a pretty long experience of about 11 years. He has passed his MBBS from the Bangalore Medical College Research Center and he did MD in pulmonary medicine from LTMMC, Mumbai. He has also did the European Diploma in Adult Respiratory in Paris. And his area of the interest is interventional pulmonology, asthma and allergy, respiratory intensive care, and sleep medicine. So uh, he will be talking about today. He will be talking about swine flu. Uh, let's revisit re revisit the disease management. So now uh, I would like to request our second speaker, Dr. Vasunitra, to continue his speech. Please, sir, Kesar Gaur, sir. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so it, it was really amazing to hear uh, Dr. Dhruv about the, the monkeypox, the new new menace around. So as we speak, speak about the new menace, well, we shouldn't forget about considering it was the year of COVID last, I think, two and a half years. And now uh, the H1N1, which is something we had thought is something of the past. Let's, let's rub it under, just let's sweep it under the carpet and forget about it and it keeps re resurfacing. So definitely uh, H1N1 pneumonia or the swine flu is something is not of the past from what we can understand. When we look at the previous epidemics, well, the first real gory, epi uh, the pandemic which really struck our world would be back in 1918 when the tiny H1N1 influenza virus, which is, as we all know, an orthomyxovirus around 80 to 120 nanometers in diameter with an RNA genome, shook the world well with the Spanish flu, which resulted in almost 3 to 5% of the world population dying. And well, it came back again once in 1978 in the US and then in 2009, where we, when we can how can we forget that situation? I still remember where, uh, you know, there was a queue outside uh, the hospitals for uh, the, the elixir against H1N1, which was uh, Tamiflu or Oseltamivir. Still remember it was so much regulated, the medicine that uh, we had to, we had to keep count of it. Uh, when, well, that was an epidemic then. And now, as we know, how easily all certain aware, which is available, just shows that it has almost turned into an endemic. But, you know, every year and around, we find this virus keeps coming back, just like with a few, you know, the antigenic uh, shifts, which it causes. But whenever there is a major antigenic uh, changes, the mutations, minor mutations, which makes us humans prone for the infection it comes back and strikes strikes his heart more recently the re, the most recent of the uh, uh, epidemics which we had in india would be in 2015 uh, which led to almost 774 deaths and 10000 out of the 10000 reported cases i'm very sure there were a lot more than that around us during that time well the incubation period of h1n1 swine flu ranges from 1 to 4 days with an average of around two days in most individuals, thus making it very, very easy to uh, to be something which is contagious. So it is short-lived, very easy to contract, 
and also it is it has a contagious period which you know for adults starts about one day before the symptom develops and lasts to around 5 to 7 days after the person develops the symptom and as you know majority of the uh, transmission happens via respiratory droplets and also via fomites there is uh, these are the two main ways by which it gets transmitted across so the the majority of these swine flu symptoms is something which we already know about we have been seeing it every day day in and day out well uh, uh, to give you the symptomatology it's the usual flu symptoms what we call the fever the chills the cough the sore throat which we always come across and headache rhinorrhea coughing uh, dizziness abdominal pain also something which we should remember is the gi symptoms so one of the most when we compare swine flu with the seasonal flu the gi symptoms are found to be a bit more common when compared to the seasonal flu in case of h1n1 also certain neurological symptoms have also been uh, noted so once the clinical diagnosis when we make a clinical diagnosis based on this the radiological diagnosis so when we order for a ct the typical uh, features which we see in a ct scan of a, of a uh, uh, h1n1 pneumonia would be that of a typical bronchocentric picture so we find ground glassing or patchy consolidation as well which is peri bronchial uh, peri bronchial in uh, distribution and we also very rarely note it is in its or most of the times bilateral very very rarely it is unilateral so something like a bronchopneumonia is what we see effusion is very very rare in uh, h1n1 pneumonias and it could finally lead to ards if it is uh, if, if the infection flares up and progresses further so initial investigation obviously would be a, an x ray which would also show typical uh, bronchopneumonia picture with uh, uh, mainly very high uh, uh, you know patchy consolidations and also bilateral consolidations which are pretty commonly present so i so once the patient comes to us what what would be the most important things which should see most important part of treating h1n1 is uh, to identify what would be the risk factors which would make a person end up having a severe infection severe infection requiring icu or hospitalization or icu leading to respiratory uh, distress i think that's what is more important because any uh, flu is otherwise a simple uh, it's it's a, it can be treated as a common flu also considering it's now in the community but it's very important at the same time not to relax and identify the patients who have the higher risk of progressing into severe infection well uh, what are all the characteristics one younger than 5 years and greater than 65 years would be um, the ones who are prone for progressing laboratory investigations it includes elevated transaminases elevated ldh and most importantly lymphopenia if it is less than the lymphopenia that means lesser than 10% uh, lesser than 800 ml uh, and 800 cells per uh, microliter is considered to be significant for the infection uh, to progress into severe time of onset of illness to diagnosis if it's more than 5 days and time of uh, internal uh, most crucial would be the initiation of the antivirals which should not be more than 48 hours from the and from the initiation of symptom so what would be the comorbid conditions most of the comorbidities like the respiratory the respiratory ailments like asthma copd especially in asthma and copd i would like to mention the ones who are uncontrolled especially the patients most of our asthma patients most of our copd patients they come to us and say talk we are you know why should we take the inhalers regularly because we are asymptomatic it's for these situations especially when there is some viral infection and if the asthma is uncontrolled and it's it definitely progresses into something like a severe infection similarly renal insufficiency diabetes uh, immunodeficiency very common among patients who are on immunosuppressants 
morbid obesity again one of the toughest patients to treat with the h1n1 pneumonia would be morbid obesity and pregnancy as well and uh, anyone which has a pneumonia or a bacterial co infection very important again to identify those who have a secondary bacterial infection or even a co infection so uh, something which is very handy would be one a total leukocyte count which is raised also if the x ray or uh, the ct scan shows frank dense consolidation which makes it prone uh, to more towards a, also a secondary bacterial infection second thing if uh, the procalcitonin i think it's very helpful now for us uh, you know the, for our uh, health is the procalcitonin if it is higher more than 0.5 or if the value goes about 2 we can consider it to be uh, uh, that there is also a, a component of bacterial infection and we should also you know cover him with an antibiotic otherwise antibiotics are rarely required and even otherwise considering being uh, the role of bronchoscopy in identifying such patients i mean to identify the bacteria and the sensitivity is again very important the most common bacteria which are which uh, have a co infection are uh, the uh, mainly the pneumococcus and uh, the moraxella catarrhalis and uh, also uh, we find very commonly uh, haemophilus influenza to be one of the other organisms which are associated similarly so once the patient gets admitted then we should also be able to identify the ones who have a, you know higher fatal outcome or mortality whom to we give more attention once they are in the hospital mm-hmm. again most important morbid obesity we have seen quite a few patients especially the ones who have oas who have symptoms of wheeze or when we hear a ronchi considering that there is a lot of airway compromise which has happened strong iron gap late diagnosis again and late antiviral therapy again immunosuppression and if the x ray shows an infiltration of more than 50% also and if the aperture to score uh, is at more than 221 at the time of admission and if there is non invasive ventilation failure that means if the ph ph there is uh, cons- uh, con- which shows a persistent uh, hypoxia sopa score of more than 5.1 and uh, and cons- persistent acidosis so this was also noted in one of the studies done in india in rajasthan which uh, noted that the same factors especially uh, male gender younger age higher clinical uh, higher clinical category of disease leukocytosis which and also presence of any major organ involvement high serum blood urea creatinine raised astlt raised cpk and ldh were also noted to be associated with high mortality well the treatment so the age old treatment sto- uh, holds good even now the uh, for uh, the oseltamivir which we use in adults would be the therapeutic dose is going to be 75 mg twice daily so not 150 mg twice daily so it is not not known to help in any ways by increasing the dose to 150 mg daily chemoprophylaxis for close contacts especially the ones who have all the high risk factors for developing severe disease go ahead and give a prophylactic dose of 75 mg od and the moment they develop any symptom start the therapeutic dose so in children again we get it as a 12 ml uh, 12 mg per ml syrup even though it's one of the most uh, uh, what do we say uh, non palatable syrups which we come across which most of the children disdain from having but definitely does help the ones who have high risk of developing into progressive disease do advise well the other two antivirals which we don't use that commonly would be a zanamivir which comes as a uh, discaler so it's an oral inhalational medication which comes and uh, also the paramivir so one of the things which i think uh, post covid uh, we have we always had uh, uh, the the we have come to know the importance of usage of iv steroids especially the ones who have severe respiratory who enter into sari well how what about its usage in uh, h1n1 well it's uh, it's noted to be you know of no use at all in fact corticosteroids in influenza 
uh, H1N1 is associated with a higher mortality. So majority of the times we have a tendency now patient comes with bilateral consolidation. Uh, you know, we are not able to identify what is the uh, cause, especially the CT pictures might not be very classical. So, and we have a tendency considering his hypoxic starting on steroids, we have to be a bit careful. I think that's one thing which we should remember. No steroids, and if it's an H1N1 or influenza pneumonia, and if he's progressing into ARDS, it's going to only worsen, unlike in COVID, where it's something which was uh, a boon to all of us, which helped us save quite a lot of patients. And yes, as I was mentioning now, to make it more confusing and make it more difficult for us, there is the COVID-19 H1N1 co-infection, which we have come across. Obviously, it is uh, very, very, it's not very commonly found, though, but uh, the prevalence of uh, co-infection in uh, one of the studies, which was dated in 2021, uh, showed that it was 0.8%. So it's, kind of, it's relatively lower, but it is associated with a higher risk of ICU admission and mortality. So uh, treatment of both antivirals for COVID as well as the H1N1 is necessary during such situations. So how do we differentiate? How do we differentiate the two when we come across in our day-to-day -day practice? So most of the times, as we know, the uh, H1N1 is more common among children and young adults, whereas COVID-19 is uh, more common among greater than 40 years. The severity increases as the age increases. Um, and one of the most common symptoms which, uh, which helps us differentiate would be anosmia, which is pretty rare in uh, H1N1, but quite common in COVID. And the CT definitely does help us. As we note, uh, this the COVID CT, which we are seeing, we are, I think the ground glassing, which has become so popularly noted by all of us is it's peripheral, subplural. Whereas if you see so nice, it's peribronchial, it is central, and it's not peripheral in case of H1N1. So CT does help because yeah, definitely we have the RT-PCR for our help to differentiate the two, but many times we do come across clinical dilemma to differentiate between the two when the, the microbiological evidence is not there. So this happens to be one of the other things which helps us differentiate the, uh, both of them. So also a small note on the vaccination front. Uh, definitely the yearly vaccination against the South Hemisphere, uh, uh, the Southern Hemisphere uh, uh, H1N1 vaccination would definitely help, which is a quadrivalent. I think all patients who have uh, higher risk factors or not just I mean, everyone, any age group, I think it needs to be administered. More so among the patients who have high risk, especially immunocompromised, diabetic, hypertensive, IHD, asthma, COPD patients. Um, so these and anyone above the age of 55 needs to be uh, vaccinated yearly against the virus. And prevention of both H1N1 and COVID remains the same once in, uh, infected. I think good, uh, uh, you know, safe, you know, the cough hygiene is of imperative. And uh, any worsening, if the patient goes on into ARDS, majority of the times, the need, early ventilation is the one which really helps. NIV does gives us some time if they improve within a day or two, but majority of the times it is the early uh, ventilation. Off late, we have definitely uh, seen a rise in this H1N1 cases, but majority are the ones who have high, high risk of developing, uh, you know, high risk, uh, high risk patients who are developing the uh, progression of the disease. And whoever has ended up on ventilation, unlike what I've seen in 2015, where patients have gone on ECMO, required ECMO and further treatment has not happened so far. I think the vaccination, which is gaining popularity, has definitely helped. And as far as my asthma patients are concerned, with regular vaccination, I've noted that the exacerbation rates, which we see, especially during winters, has definitely gone down and definitely it works wonders. So these are just a small revisit to our, uh, uh, our uh, present H1N1 situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vastu Netra. It was a wonderful talk. Uh, 
yeah yes sir thank you very much sir thank you uh, it was a timely presentation uh, because we had an very bad episode of swine flu in 2014 and 15 so now again uh, swine flu h1n1 is raising his head along with the covid so really it was a timely presentation thank you sir for our excellent presentation on swine flu thank you sir Uh, thank you i mean uh, we have our audience on youtube uh, they are yeah. watching us on live on youtube and uh, i must uh, say I, i will mention few names who have appreciated both the talks dr prajapati surendra dr vinod shah dr deepak torawala dr umar ji dr pragnesh joshi dr navneet wadgama dr bupesh chawda dr kamya sarda dr ramlal lola they all have joined and they have appreciated the both the talks so far uh there is one question i think doctor from dr diran meta but i think he, uh, dr uh, um, uh, netra has covered it uh, how can we suspect clinically which one is more likely and uh, out of covid and uh, swine flu which one is more likely how can we identify clinically i think uh, uh, dr vasu netra has covered this topic That's also cool. and there is one more que question regarding the vaccination uh should we all doctors uh, should take these flu shots every yearly every year uh, as you know in us it is mandatory i mean it is uh, uh, everybody all common public also take uh, flu shots every year so is it uh, necessary for all doctors to take this flu shot every year i think it's man we should we are the ones who are facing the music every day i am sure uh, you know considering the the season is around and in fact the flu season this time has started a bit early in fact uh, so i would definitely i mean we should i mean i've been taking and in fact if you see even the uh, the uh, mncs here in bangalore make it mandatory for their employees to take the flu shot every year and i think as doctors we should as well make it a point and as an association uh, all of us should make it mandatory for our own good and we are the ones who are in fact getting exposed on daily basis we are the ones who are uh, definitely i would totally agree that is necessary and absolutely necessary okay thank Thanks. you very much dr okay. vasunetra now uh, we are moving ahead with our third topic uh, we have with us very dynamic young uh, infection disease specialist dr pratik sawaj is there with us uh, and he will be talking about covid as all of you know covid still is uh, troubling us a uh, few patients here and there they are coming so what is the latest update on covid what is the latest treatment guidelines for covid all these points will be covered by dr pratik sawad dr pratik sawad you can start your talk now uh, <clears throat> thank you sir i i hope i am audible and visible and my slides are visible also yes yes yes, yes. So, uh thank you yatish sir thank you dinesh sir for the kind introduction so i'll be talking on covid 19 update and what i will speak is what is new in covid 19 i will not revise what we all know so this is happening all over the world so people are giving now more and more attention to monkey pox and now forgetting the covid 19 so this talk will remind you that uh, we we should not forget covid 19 and there are certain new aspect which even i was not knowing so while making this presentation i came to know certain new aspect of covid 19 so this is outline of my talk So this is just uh, recent data from the newspaper that total 18,000 new cases has been added to the COVID-19 tally, and overall there are 40 new deaths uh, which has been observed in last uh, few days. This is the till now uh, total 4.42 crore case has been detected in last 24 hour. It is the 28,000 cases. So it is not stopping. Now we have so many question right now. The why it is not stopping. what are we what new thing which we are observing and my previous uh, speaker also mentioned that the flu and uh, covid they both are coming together so out of 100 i would say around 5 to 10% of the people they have uh, uh, both the virus together so there is definitely something uh, new thing has been happening now we know about the delta variant we know about the omicron variant but right now all over the world this ba5 variant is dominating so this is data from australia and it is clearly showing that ba5 variant is rising even in the united states the most common 
the predominant variant is a BA5 variant. So new and new sub variant are coming and uh, it is changing the scenario. But luckily, like within few months, uh, this genomic, the SARS was sequenced and within a few months, the trial, vaccine trial has been begun and within a year, we got a very effective vaccine. So thanks to uh, this, uh, the world and vaccine manufacturer, especially from the India, we'll uh, applaud the uh, Serum Institute, which uh, has done tremendous work. But there are two burning questions which came to my mind. Uh, when I was making this PPT, that despite the effective vaccination, why we are still seeing COVID-19 cases are rising and why there is mortality is different from country to country. So in the hunt to uh, answer, my hunt to answer this question, I found something interesting. So there is one term known as a vaccine inequality. Now, those who don't know this term, this is a very excellent article which has mentioned what is a vaccine inequality. So this is what happening right now. Developed country like United States and Canada, their vaccine stock is expiring. And the country which is developing, like African country, they are not getting enough vaccine. So this developing country, they are not ready to give vaccines to this developing country. And their vaccine stock is expiring and they are not getting new vaccines. So new and new variant are originating from the country which, has, which are poorly vaccinated. And that leads to COVID-19 pandemic. So if we don't uh, sort out this uh, vaccine inequality, this pandemic will never end. So there are so many epidemiologists, they are requesting the government and the government of the developed country that try to distribute vaccine to all over the world. So if we can vaccinate all the people, like entire world at one point of time, then and then we can uh, get over with this pandemic. Otherwise, this pandemic will last a long. Now, the second question that why there is a mortality is different from different countries. So, this is based on the vaccination wall. So, this is the vaccination wall of Australia, vaccination wall of New Zealand, vaccination wall of the United States, and this is the South African country. So, if you see the vaccination wall, it, it is decided by which variant is predominant in your country, uh, uh, which vaccine has been taken by the country, how many doses has been com completed by the country, what are the comorbidities, predominant comorbidities in your country. So that decides the vaccination wall. And if you see, if you compare the uh, country to country vaccination was wall is totally different. So that is why uh, I have heard so many doctors talking that India has a lowest mortality. Now that might be prepared uh, because of the our vaccination wall is totally different than the Western culture. So uh, this is the thing. Now you must have seen in your OPD that those patients who has recovered from COVID, they are coming with very vague symptoms. Like after many months, they come with a chest pain, lump in a throat, feeling of hot and cold in the extremity, heavy arm, weakness. So these are known as a long COVID symptom. And this is the article in which it has been seen that one out of eight people, around 12.7 people has developed long COVID symptom. So I do see many patients comes to my OPD that sir, still I am feeling weak. I am not that normal person which I used to be uh, before my COVID-19 illness. So the long COVID is the common problem. This is the article in the Nature Journal which has shown that the rapid rise in the uh, cardiac event. So this was the done, this was a study done on the more uh, like those who have recovered from COVID-19 and those who required ICU admission, they, has, they had a higher chances of stroke, uh, atrial fibrillation, inflammatory heart disease, uh, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, clotting in the blood. And so all kinds of cardiac events, they were rising. Not only adult, but in many pediatricians, they are also observing the rise in the condition of heart condition, kidney failure, blood clots, and diabetes in the pediatric population also. So definitely this COVID-19 pandemic has changed our epidemiology that, that has changed certain disease. Now I'll show you one interesting case. And uh, uh, the, the, I don't know whether you have seen this kind of patient or not. So he is a young male patient who is working in the bank and he was having COVID-19 positive in January 2020. So it was mild COVID-19. So after one year, he came to my OPD. That sir, since last one year, I have not regained my smell and the test sensation. So he has lost his smell and test over a period of one year. Now you can imagine the life without smell and test. So he's saying that whatever 
uh, food I am taking, I am not uh, enjoying that food. Everything is same for me. So I thought that 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 there might be some background sinusitis. So I did CT PNS, which was normal. I did B12, D3, it was normal. Even I I thought that that might be some uh, frontal lobe disorder or something like that. So I I did MRI brain. That was also normal. And I also try to rule out the psychological cause that is it a depression, is it any kind of psychosis, but I couldn't found any uh, triggering factor, any stressful event. So what could be the reason why he's not gaining smell and taste? And then I found the article that there are many people, they have lost smell and taste for up to two years. So you can imagine how COVID-19 has affected life of so many people. And then I have total five patients who who are in my one year follow up, they have not regained their taste and smell sensation. So up to two year, a uh, person can lose his the uh, taste and smell sensation. Now I will rapidly shift my talk to the antiviral drug. And there are two oral antiviral drugs. One is a molnupiravir and second is a plexovid. So after this trial, the molnupiravir was accepted by so many uh, doctors. But whenever you see any trial, you need to see the trial was done by any uh, medical group or it is funded by pharma. So this was the trial which was funded by pharma. So whenever you see any trial which is funded by pharma, you have to take with a pinch of salt. Now what this trial has uh, uh, shown that there is a 50% reduction in the admission and the reduction in the death when patient was taking monopiravir. But do we really need molnupiravir? Because the, this trial was done in the mild infection. Uh, this trial was done those who, who were not vaccinated. And our patients are vaccinated. Our patients, uh, our patients might not need this kind of antiviral drug. And there is a problem of uh, uh, mutagenesis. There is a problem of cartilage toxicity. So we need to see uh, de in detail regarding this trial that whether do we need molnupiravir or not. And second drug is a Plexovid, which is by Pfizer, and it is the generic name of Proteus inhibitor. And again, this trial has shown to uh, a reduction in the symptom severity. But there is one phenomenon known as a Plex, uh, Plexovid rebound, which is trending on the Twitter. What they are saying that uh, after taking Plexovid, there is a uh, there is there is an increased viremia. So Plexovid is inducing the uh, virus uh, uh, progression in 30% of the cases. So uh, this thing we need to check before using the Plexovid. This is a short summary between the Molnupiravir and Plexovid. So Molnupiravir is approved for more than 18 years, while Plexovid is approved for more than 12 years. And you need to give within a five days of symptom onset. Now, whenever you give any antiviral, it should be as early as possible. And uh, we don't require hepatic and renal dose adjustment in Molnupiravir and in Plexovid it is required. And a plexovid is like proteus inhibitor, so there are certain drug interactions, so watchful for the drug interaction. Now, here comes the remdesivir, and again, there are lots of myths uh, in the population. And still, <clears throat> recently, yesterday, I saw one patient who required remdesivir. I explained the relative that uh, your patient needs remdesivir, but relative refused for the remdesivir. Why? Because there are lots of false information is uh, ongoing in the media and the newspaper that remdesivir causes kidney failure, remdesivir causes heart failure. But it is not like that. Remdesivir is one of the most, most safe antiviral available to now. And after this trial in NEGM, that if you give remdesivir early, even in the mild patient, it is associated with the good prognosis. So this is the data which has shown that 87% reduction in the hospitalization or death as compared to placebo. What I am doing in my practice that within a seven days, I prefer antiviral drug. And uh, antiviral drug is mainly for unvaccinated population or those who have a high risk. So you can find the high risk in the CDC website. It's like diabetes, heart failure, like chronic lung disorder, <clears throat> something like that. Excuse me. Still, I prefer <coughs> IV remdesivir and if patient is not ready for remdesivir, my second choice is monopiravir or plexomid. Now, I find there are certain problems in the Indian guidelines. So, if you see, this is the Indian guideline and what they are saying that remdesivir is to be given when patient is a hypoxic, like group B. Now, whenever you see in your practice, now hypoxic patient mostly come in the second week. Now, phase of viremia that lasts in the first week. 
So what is point of giving uh, remdesivir in the second week? So that is my take against guidelines. So when you want to consider remdesivir, you can uh, start as soon as possible. And there, there is a problem of this contaminated remdesivir vial. So this was a, one publication in the newspaper that a few remdesivir were contaminated. And after giving remdesivir, patient went into septicemic shock. So that we need to uh, that we need to remember. So I have started doing this known as a remdesivir consent, in which I mention the indication. I also mention the batch number, and I also add the remark that after giving remdesivir, there was no hypotension or shock. So regarding the antiviral, this is my summary that early is a better, like within seven days. In OPD patient, you only give symptomatic treatment. You don't need anything. But when, when you think that patient has a high-grade fever, uh, when patient is having severe lethargy, patient is having comorbidities, patient is unvaccinated, then uh, remdesivir should be preferred. And still, there is a there is no clear role of cocktail therapy in the current pandemic. Uh, initially, it was found to be beneficial when there was a Delta virus predominant. But again, with the new and new uh, variant, the cocktail therapy is becoming inferior. Now, I would like all of you to remember this quote by William Osler that whenever you give any drug, whether it's a dexamethasone, whether it's a remdesivir, whether it's a zinc, vitamin D3, calcium, so your patient has to recover twice, one from mm -hmm. the disease, one from the medicine. Mm -hmm. So choose your medicine carefully and don't give any medicine blindly. Now, this is the vaccination update which we all want to know. And even uh, uh, this is one of the good publication from the CDC website that why do we need third dose? Like, is it is it not okay I would take only second dose? So in one of the recent conference, when I asked the doctor that how many doctor has taken third dose, I, I could see around 20 to 25% of the doctor has not taken the third dose. Now, uh, because of certain myth, I don't know what was the reason, but see, this is the benefit of third dose. So those, those who have taken only second dose, they have, this was the risk factor for the admission and they getting COVID. And those who have taken the third dose, you can see the baseline, uh, this thing. So almost you can say that uh, there is a higher risk of protection in the third, third dose. Now, we Indian are discussing regarding third dose and the Western country, they have started the fourth dose. Now, now uh, what is the benefit of third dose? So this was the trial done in the Israel, done on the 30,000 uh, healthcare worker. And they found the rate of admission and the rate of getting uh, infection is much, much lower in those who have taken the fourth dose. So current recommendation for fourth dose comes to the doctor. So we all are categorically fall in the fourth dose. But first, if you have taken a third dose and if you have completed like uh, uh, three to six months, then you are eligible for the fourth dose. But currently our Indian guideline don't mention regarding fourth dose. And officially, we can't get four dose uh, unless it is recommended by this thing. Immunocompromised people, certain comorbid condition, they also require the fourth dose. Now, they are saying four to six months after the third dose. So, those, the, those doctors who are listening to this webinar and those who have not taken third dose, please take the third dose as soon as possible. The Bharat Biotech, uh, now... Uh, Another new good news regarding vaccine that Bharat Biotech is coming with the COVID-19 live vaccine, intranasal vaccine. So that is a good part. Uh, live vaccine is always superior to dead vaccine because it induces more immune response. So this is good news that uh, nasal vaccine will come. I, uh, I, I'm waiting for the data, which is not available on the website. Okay, so I would like to end with this seven, uh, seven I would say, takeaway, which I learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. First is the true information. High quality data is hard to find. Now, each and every day, new and new publications are coming. I don't know which, which one is authentic, which is funded by pharma company, which is done by a good group of people. So it is very hard to find a true data. Second thing is, if you are uh, really seeing many patients, try to uh, uh, conduct study, try to be part of scientific study. So I am part of two multi-center study done on COVID-19 pandemic. So that will be published soon. So it will be seen as a work contribution towards the science. I would say that teamwork is always best whenever we are managing a pandemic. So like we need a, a public-private partnership. We need to, even if I'm managing COVID-19 patient, I need to listen to my pulmonologist, 
colleague i need to listen to my intensivist colleague even i need uh, opinion of endocrinologist if uh, there is a high sugar so definitely a uh, team work is always helpful be ready to digest new information fast because new and new information will come so you need to accept few high quality information and try to apply in your practice being doctor it is your duty to first protect yourself i would still recommend all the doctor to wear n95 mask in your opd and ipd and try to take vaccine as i mentioned third dose is necessary even uh, not only covid vaccine but you should also take the influenza vaccine which is uh, needed i have taken influenza vaccine long time ago i would say that promote vaccines in your practice not only uh, as being doctor we are not only uh, we should write the prescription of medicine we should also ask our patient to take vaccine and uh, right now if you want to know a good quality information twitter is a new place so most of the uh, information which i have presented in my slide i got it from twitter and uh, there are uh, there are good scientists i would say epidemiologists researchers they are available actively available on twitter and they are providing new and new information high quality information so definitely you should go and check it out and with this i would like to end my presentation and i am happy to take any question if you have thank you very much thank dr savaj yes thank you very much uh, sir dr pratik here yeah, there is one question from dr madhusudan over ji uh, is there any role of fevipiravir you have not mentioned fevipiravir in your talk is there any role okay so uh, if i want to place fevipiravir so right now i think i have stopped using fevipiravir since last one year uh, the reason there are two reason i couldn't find any good quality of evidence uh, regarding uh, fevipiravir and second thing my practical experience that uh, uh, there was no much difference of prescribing fevipiravir to my practice so in opd patient if i want to treat i usually prefer uh, the uh, symptomatic treatment i i don't prescribe any form of antiviral drug okay thank you uh, there is one question from dr mahadev desai uh, in uh, trial ram in remdesivir trial there was no death in placebo group also so how can one say that was reduced with remdesivir uh, i think like he is uh, he is asking about remdesivir what is the effectiveness of remdesivir okay so actually uh, remdesivir was given uh, there were so many trials available regarding remdesivir and uh, not only about uh, clinical trial if you ask my clinical experience and the clinical experience of my colleague which i am working with so everyone felt that when we start remdesivir early i would say that not in the all the patient but like high risk group unvaccinated people those who present with the severe symptom in that patient giving remdesivir was found to be beneficial okay there is one question from dr pk rana uh, what about vaccine induced side e side effects right so uh, there was one terminology known as a vaccine induced thrombotic uh, uh, thrombosis so that was trending uh, i think few months ago but the incidence of vaccine associated thrombosis and the covid associated thrombosis the covid associated thrombosis was more so definitely vaccine associated thrombosis were reported by many uh, doctors and even in my practice i have seen few patient that after taking vaccine they didn't had any comorbidity and they they landed with mi or like a thrombotic state so there is there is certain chance of uh, but the percentage is not uh, the great means you can you can ignore the percentage uh, it is like less than 0.1% something like that but definitely with that thing the sentence will not change that vaccine is not needed vaccine is definitely needed second thing i have seen one patient who has received vaccine and he developed the cardiomyopathy so that that thing i have seen and third thing i have seen vaccine induced multi system inflammation so mis so these are the few side effect which i have seen uh, with the covid vaccine 
देर इज वन क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम डॉक्टर जयेश तमाको वाला पोस्ट कोविड वैक्सीनेशन मेनी ऑटो इम्यून डिजीज आर सीन वॉट इज योर टेक I think it is open. This, I mean, question is open for all. I mean, Doctor Drew, you have also joined. You can also answer if. Uh... So I would say that I have I haven't observed that phenomenon. Uh, I I think other doctor might comment also, but in my practice, I haven't observed the rise in the autoimmune disorder. Yeah, we we have diagnosed more autoimmune diseases in vaccinated people, but it is just awareness. nothing to do with the vaccine so uh, two of my colleagues also said that autoimmune diseases have increased it is not increase it is more of diagnosis and probably nothing related to vaccine but my one question to dr pratik uh, can i have one question yes sir yes sir yes, 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 sir. Uh, yes sir dr pratik when it comes to favipiravir used early uh, in mild diseases uh, or mild to moderate diseases where it was used we always say that it was used so early that we cannot say that uh, really it was useful or not and when it comes to remdesivir uh we say that because it was used late it did not give good result so for me all antivirals are to be used very early just like swine flu where we use tamiflu on day 1 or 2 so uh, it's it's very difficult for one to say that remdesivir is more useful than favipiravir i am strongly using remdesivir and i am not using favipiravir for last one year as you are doing but as evidence is go remdesivir still does not have the the strong or robust evidence to indicate just as we indicate rest of the antiviral in certain diseases true sir true i would agree to you that uh, uh, any form of antiviral has a benefit when they are given early and uh, definitely there is no uh, good quality of information regarding remdesivir and same with the favipiravir i would say that see uh, sir what i think that favipiravir is like a japanese molecule and uh, uh, if you see the larger uh, high quality data they are from nigm and the lancet but again there was a uh, uh, we don't know how to rely on the this journals because they are also funded by pharma so the 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 last sentence which i put in my key take away that it is very hard to find the high quality data so we don't have a like bigger trial for favipiravir favipiravir might be working i i am not saying that it is not working it might be working but uh, there are no good like large number data for the favipiravir and regarding remdesivir sir the all the early and trial which was done that they, they were not properly conducted like given early given on time so they were mostly given in the second week third week something like that and recently uh, which one trial which i have included in my presentation that they, they they have taken early remdesivir and in which uh, it was found to be, be beneficial so i think uh, any 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 more question uh, yeah in comment section there is one more question from dr hitendra modi how long fever persist in latest covid virus infections so i think even uh, not more than 5 to 7 days i would say that not longer than that okay so many of the many of our colleagues who have who have joined on youtube they have appreciated our talk dr mahadev desai dr shailesh gandhi dr jayesh samako ala dr mahendra bhat everybody has appreciated our talk uh, so i think uh, bye bye uh, okay can we end the session yeah. now oh, sure, sure yeah we are yeah, very much yeah. thankful to all three speakers yeah. dr urman Dr. yes dr yeah, drum you want to say before, something yeah. before you conclude we must thank both dr lapsiwala and dr goel for nicely conducting the session on behalf of all three speakers thank you very much thank, thank you, you very much sir Thank so, you, sir. Uh, Thank you, on behalf of FFPI, I am heartily thankful to Dr. Urman Drew, Dr. Vasu Netra, and Dr. Pratik Savaj for accepting our invitation for preparing their uh, talk so nicely and uh, uh, enlightening enlightening our members. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining on YouTube to all the members of FFPI. Thank you, Dr. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Dinesh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Thank you, all the three speakers. 
and the, all, both the uh, coordinators also, right? And uh, one or two uh, announcements that uh, you all know that uh, we are also conducting this type of uh, webinars and even the hybrid uh, seminars also. So in your unit, if you are doing such activities, please let us know and we will have it on our YouTube also. And uh, one more thing that uh, in uh, the January 2023 on 7th and 8th, we are having our uh, national conference, FAPI conference at Ahmedabad. So those who are not still registered, please register yourself or please uh, uh, persuade your friends to register because we are also giving to giving the platform to all the family physicians to present their uh, part also. So having the good uh, academic uh, feast also at that time. So thanking all the uh, viewers also who have joined uh, on YouTube. And uh, again, good night to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much.